So I had this idea back in early March for a sort of video series talking about the Criterion channel in its first year. Of course, I didn't actually start on it until the one year anniversary mark of the official launch date of the Criterion channel, but now I am here having prepared everything that I'm going to do with this sort of series. I don't know if you could necessarily call it a series, but that's just what I'm going with for now. The Criterion Channel Year One. I'm not sure how many videos this is going to be. I'm probably going to base it more on time rather than a certain number of films per video, but essentially I am going through every film that I watched on the Criterion Channel in its first year. Well, its first year and the like charter subscriber period before its official launch date. There are 92 films that I will be discussing. I am keeping it pretty general and brief, but still going into, I'm going to tell you the title, the year, the country slash language. I'm pretty much going to say like, this is an American film and that implies that it's in English. If I say this is a French film, that implies that it's in French. Unless I need to specify the language, I will. Um, I will say the director, give a brief synopsis, and my rating and thoughts on the film. All of which I have written out in a 52 page Word document. This is the first time I am doing a voiceover. I'm just recording on my phone and then I'm going to copy it, transfer it to my computer, and put it in a video. So I've also spent a lot of time not only writing all these synopses and my thoughts and such, but also saving photos and clips of the films that I'm going to be talking about because obviously it's nice to have some visuals along with my random thoughts. I will also let you know if the film is currently available on the Criterion channel as of the 9th of May 2020, that is when I am recording this. And in the final installment, I will be giving some like random statistics about the films that I watched, uh, go over some of the standout films or the films that left more of an impression on me, just if you didn't watch all the videos then that could be a sort of like summary of like hey these were the films that i recommend the most because i loved them the most um and then some sort of like pros and cons what i like about the criterion channel and where i think improvements can be made and that's a major part of why i wanted to do this sort of series i'm also speaking as someone who has not i did not have Filmstruck, so I've only had the Criterion channel. I do have a list on Letterboxd with all of the films. It's pretty much just listed. I don't um, have any like notes. There's nothing necessarily that I'm going to be discussing about the film in these videos that is on my Letterboxd. I am not very good with like writing reviews for everything or even just like a brief paragraph um, for everything that I watch. But I do have my ratings are from my Letterboxd from when I first watched the films. But I will link my Letterboxd and this list in the description below. I'm pretty much just going through any other things that I need to say since this is the first video. I do write on my like description for my Letterboxd list that just some extra information. I have the tendency to focus on films that expire at the end of the month. So there are a lot of films that I have like in my list that I've, I've noticed on the channel and haven't watched yet. But again, I'll like opt for something that is going to expire over something that has been in my list and that I've been meaning to get to. But again, I go for something that isn't going to be available anymore. I'm gonna have a disclaimer here and just some other brief information that I feel the need to go over before I finally get started with the films I watched. Sorry, but again, I just, these are things that I feel the need to say, so I'm gonna say them and I typed it up, so here we go. A disclaimer. 
I'm a little particular about my ratings on Letterboxd. I don't have a specific system, I just go with what I'm feeling, but I rarely give films a four and a half or five out of five stars. And if I click the, the heart, it usually means I really enjoyed the film, I really loved the film, and or I would rewatch the film. The rewatchability for me is a big factor in terms of the heart. The rating is also mostly dependent on the film on its own. Like two films that I rated a three out of five stars, for example, can be different ratings. They can mean different things. That being said, these are my personal ratings and thoughts on the films based on my experience watching them. Some films I watched supplements for if they were available, but not too many. You may disagree with me with my ratings and my thoughts, respectfully, of course. I also feel like usually if I have like lukewarm or lesser feelings on a film, it can really sound negative and like I didn't like it. I just want to emphasize that if I say something that isn't praising a film, it doesn't mean that I'm being negative necessarily, even if it may come off that way. Hopefully you understand the distinction I'm trying to make here. At least 14 of these I talked about before in videos. Last June, I did a 30 films in 30 days challenge for fun because I could. I didn't put too much pressure on myself, which is why I only got to 23 films and not 30, but I have videos on those films that I watched during that challenge. Not all of which were on the Criterion channel, but I think there were 14 films that I watched that month that were on the channel. I did not watch back any of those videos from that month on um, like in preparation for this video because I want I want it to be my perspective now and if there's something really memorable about a film it's likely that I'm going to repeat it in this video. And then lastly, uh, the synopses. These are basic synopses. I hope I'm doing the films enough justice with my wording here in trying to be detailed but vague. My thoughts are quite general as well. I'm not going into each film extensively because I don't want these videos to be a bajillion minutes long as I hit the 10 minute mark on my, <laughs> on my voice recording here and I haven't even truly begun. But here we go, the films that I watched. So number one, we have Mikey and Nikki from 1976. This is an American film directed by Elaine May. The synopsis of this, a small-time bookie who stole mob money is in hiding and he begs a childhood friend to help him evade the hitman who's on his tail. This one actually I just took straight from Letterboxd because that's pretty much what I would have said, but I like the way that this is worded, so I just copied it from Letterboxd. I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars. It was engaging, but it felt long. I wanted a little bit more to happen, especially with the characters, instead of things happening and not seeming cohesive with the characters and the depth that I wanted, if that makes sense. I always like seeing John Cassavetes on screen. He has this excitement and enthusiasm that just pours out of him when he's on screen. I just repeat it on screen twice, it's fine. Um, and I feel like he usually plays kind of mysterious characters often or like sketchy characters. Um, and this currently is available on the Criterion channel. Number two, Chungking Express, a Chinese film from 1994 directed by Wong Kar Wai. The first half is a story of a young man being infatuated with a woman who was caught up in an underground operation. The second half is a story of a man and the young woman who works at a food place around Chungking Station. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars and clicked the heart. I feel like this is a film that can easily grow on me and be quite rewatchable, something like you can put on every so often and pay attention or just have it on in the background. The young woman, Faye, reminds me of Amelie, the character in the French film of the same title, Amelie. Just a little less stylized and yet I just found Chunking Express to be really enjoyable. Am I giving these enough minutes? <laughs> um, all right, well, let's see how many films we can fit in one video. I'll maybe try to make this video 30 minutes and then stop. I don't know, I'm just talking. I feel like I'm not natural enough. So, sorry about that also. Sorry because I don't necessarily like sounding like I'm reading something. I want it to sound more natural. 
Number three, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, a British film from 1960. Oh, shoot, sorry. <laughs> Chunking Express is currently available to watch on the Criterion channel. Number three, Saturday Night and Sunday Morning, a British film from 1960, directed by Carol Ries. Going back to the point where I, I said that I feel like I'm not saying it naturally, I kind of am saying the synopses like a little less natural on purpose, just saying. So the synopsis of this film. A young man works on the weekdays and enjoys himself on the weekends, including indulging in drinking and dating both a young woman and a married woman. But problems and conflicts arise with this lifestyle and activities he engages in. I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars. I don't have a lot to say. I think it's it's a film where if I had read the book, I feel like I would have liked the presumable more fleshed out characters. I'm saying that assuming the book would go into the characters a bit more. I don't have much to say, which is something else. This is going to fluctuate a lot between like, I don't know what else to say and here's a whole essay. And this is currently available to watch on the Criterion channel. Am I going to say that full sentence every time? <laughs> I'm not sure. But number four is Tom Jones, a British film from 1963 directed by Tony Richardson. Tom Jones, a bastard child and his adultish shenanigans. I also gave this a three out of five stars. I had higher hopes for this because it's a period piece and I like the artwork for the Criterion cover and I watched the clip on Criterion's website and it's a good clip. So it was a bit of a letdown. I probably would have given it a lower rating if not for liking the costumes, liking Lady Belliston, who was played by Joan Greenwood, and for the story being wild, <laughs> wild at some parts. And just what I mean by wild is like the plot of this film, some things that happen. It's not not like wild, like they're partying or anything thing like that. It's just like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> Can you repeat that, please? Wild. Mm -hmm. And this is available to watch on the Criterion channel. Currently. <laughs> Number five, The Fabulous Baron Munchausen, a Czech film from 1962, directed by Carol Zeman. The Fabulous Baron Munchausen goes to the moon, lives in a whale, flies on a cannonball, and much more. He has many adventures all the while pursuing the princess he has fallen in love with. I gave this a 4 out of 5 stars and clicked the heart. I love the style of this and it's sort of being mixed media and just the different ways of showing what's happening. It's one of those films that makes you think it's an earlier film than it actually is, in my opinion. This is a story that goes all over the place, like I made the synopsis sound, but it was entertaining um, and it's definitely supposed to be plot driven so i didn't care about how the characters were necessarily like acting and you know what was going on with them and their relationships and such this is definitely one of those films that i'm like i love the way it looks and that's a major reason why i love the movie and this is currently available yes to watch on the criterion channel number six okay this one's iffy i I had to go back. I, I did not have this list originally like made, so I wasn't, it's not like I was adding films to the list as I was watching them. When I came up with this idea in March, I had to add everything by going through my like diary on Letterboxd and then add them to the list from my memory basically. And so this one film, I do not remember where I watched. So I'm going to include it even though I don't think it was on the Criterion channel, but I'm going to include it just in case. So here we go. Number six, questioning if it was actually on the Criterion channel, especially because it's not available right now. 99 River Street, an American film from 1953, directed by Phil Carlston. A former boxer who is now a taxi driver and his actress friend get caught up in a robbery carried out by jewel thieves, one of which was having an affair with the boxer's wife and murdered her. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars. Evelyn Keyes, the um, actress who plays the actress friend, 
stole the show for me. There's one scene in particular that she's incredible in, and it's both a testament to the character and Evelyn Keyes as an actress, and that's the most memorable part of this film. It also, the plot reminds me of Deadline at Dawn, which is a film from 1946, which I really like, and I prefer that one to this, so just a bit of comparison. I think that if you like that film, you would like this, and if you like this film, you would like Deadline at Dawn as well. Um, I just, I don't, there's a comparison, I guess. So, 99 River Street, I don't think I watched it on the Criterion channel, but in case I did, here it is. Number seven, Bicycle Thieves, an Italian film from 1948 directed by Vittoria De Sica. A man in the post-World War II depression gets his bike stolen, which is mandatory for his work. He and his son, with some other men who also help along the way, look for it throughout the city and also for the man who took it. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars. I did think it was a great film, but not as great as I wanted it to be or expected it to be because I think it's one of the foreign films I had heard a lot about when I first really started getting into like a wider range of cinema. And there were quite a number of people who like just kept mentioning it. I don't, I just remember hearing the title a lot and seeing the, the Criterion cover often. Maybe it just happened to come out on the Criterion collection when, when I first discovered it perhaps. Um, but there are quite a number of memorable parts from the film. I'm, I'm not sure how often I would rewatch this and I have yet to watch the supplements, which I do want to get to. I'm really hoping that I can learn more about like the Italian movement of neorealism in film uh, because I don't know that much about it and I know that this is like a title that really represents that period. So I really hope to gain more of an appreciation for it by watching the supplements when I do get around to it. And this is currently available on the channel. It is available as a sort of collection, so you click the film and it has all the supplements available to you that would be on the disc. Number eight, The Rules of the Game, a French film from 1936, directed by Jean Renoir. A group of rich friends have a holiday at a country chateau where they and the household staff engage in weekend activities and affairs. I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars. This is also a case of expectations. I wanted this to be more like farcical. Um, there's quite a lot of slapstick comedy if I'm remembering correctly, but I just I wanted more like entanglements and sticky situations. And there are really serious moments that I felt clashed with the rest of the film. That could be a case of just me going into it with too much comedic expectation, but I, I really wasn't expecting the very serious moments, especially like towards the end. Obviously, I'm being vague and not going into spoilers. The Rules of the Game is available to watch on the channel. Numbers 9, 10, and 11 are the Three Colors trilogy. So number 9, we have Three Colors Blue, a French film from 1993 directed by Krzysztof Kieslowski, a woman tries to grieve and move on from the death of her husband and daughter. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars and click the heart. This is very much a character study kind of film. Julie, the main character, really isolates herself and doesn't interact much with others, except Olivier, who's a good friend of hers, who is also in love with her. There were a lot of shots in this film that I really liked. And it also made me think of The Double Life of Veronique at times, which is from the same director, which came out just a couple years previous in 1991. So then number 10, Three Colors White, a French and Polish film from 1994. This one is about a French woman who is divorcing her Polish husband who tries to win her back by being a successful businessman at home in Poland where he has to be smuggled back into. I gave this a 3 out of 5 stars. I know I didn't like this more than Blue, so I felt like I needed to differentiate the two in some way through my rating, but in hindsight, especially after having seen the supplements, this might be pretty even with Blue. I learned a lot more and, and quite a bit about Kieślowski and Poland at that time, which just really enhances the film. Um, I watched the supplements for Blue and White, but not Red, which is the next film, Three Colors Red, from 1994. This one is in French. 
A young woman accidentally runs over a dog whose owner turns out to be a retired judge who spies on his neighbors by listening in on their phone conversations and the young woman and judge develop a friendship. This one was my favorite. I gave this one a four out of five stars and clicked the heart. I love this movie. Like it has potential, potentials there to be a 4.5 out of five stars. I, I love connections and like parallels in films. So that I feel like is really present in this one. I love the connections of like background characters to neighbors of the judge and parallels that happen with like storylines and characters. I tend to really like stories that involve unconventional relationships in some way. And I would also put this film in that category. Three Colors Red was my favorite of the three. And the entire trilogy is available on the Criterion Collection. On, well, yes, in the collection, but I meant to say channel. <laughs> Number 12, Funny Games, an Austrian film from 1997, so it's in German, directed by Michael Haneke. Two young men hold a family hostage and torture them through playing sadistic games for fun. I gave this a 3.5 out of 5 stars and clicked the heart. This is not a rewatch for me, but I have seen the 2007 American remake of this, which is like really just a shot for shot replica with actors who are speaking English. It's the same film. Uh, there's specifically a great scene in this involving a remote that plays like plays with the fourth wall and camera, but also the story. It's terrible what happens in that scene and the rest of the movie, but that, that scene is so standout to me and I do really like this film, although it's terrible to watch what happens. And it is, yes, available on the channel. Number 13, the first rewatch, Grey Gardens from 1975, an American documentary directed by Albert and David Maisels. This is a documentary about Edith Beale and Edith Beale, aka Big Edie and Little Edie. They were aunt and cousin to Jackie Kennedy and they were ostracized. They continued living at Grey Gardens, which is the name of the estate in East Hampton where they lived. And they stayed even when they were essentially being forced out and off of the property. Grey Gardens is just a look into their daily life at Grey Gardens. So I gave this a four out of five stars. I clicked the heart. I already mentioned that it's a rewatch because I love this film. This honestly should be like a 4.5 out of five stars. I love this movie so much. I'm really glad it's on the channel because I can watch it all the time. <laughs> I say that, but I don't probably because it would be really bad if I just played it over and over and over again. But I'm glad that it's there on the channel for me to watch at my leisure. And I actually think I like rewatched it, but I didn't end up logging it. Like later that weekend, I watched it again. I really should just own it at this point, but it's on the channel, so I almost feel like it's okay that I don't own it. I'd rather buy I'd rather buy titles that aren't available to me. I love Little Edie. I really admire her and think she's such an interesting person. I feel like at the same time that she's entertaining and amusing, she can be really relatable. She's just like this, she's a beautiful soul, okay? And this is just me raving about little Edie. Big Edie is great too and their dynamic like with each other comes off so well and it's hilarious at times, but you can tell that they get on each other's nerves, especially both staying in the house like 24 seven, but they continue living there together and loving each other. And I love them. Rest in peace, big and little Edie. So then number 14 is The Beals of Grey Gardens from 2006, also directed by the Maisel brothers. This is just more footage from Grey Gardens, but after they were already in the process of editing the film, the crew went back to get more footage to sort of like fill in blanks and have a bit more structure to the documentary. I gave this a four out of five stars and clicked the heart. It's equally as enjoyable as Grey Gardens, more little Edie to love, and I hadn't seen this one before, only the main documentary. So technically this one is not a rewatch. All of Grey Gardens as a whole, as like, as a Criterion release is available on the Criterion channel. So Grey Gardens, the Beals of Grey Gardens, and all the supplements that would come on the discs. Number 15, After the Wedding, a Danish film from 2006 directed by Suzanne Beer. 
Jacob is looking to get financing for an orphanage he manages in India, and he comes back to Denmark to meet with a businessman who ends up inviting Jacob to his daughter's wedding. The businessman and his family have secrets that Jacob gets caught up in, but this is a drama, not suspenseful. That description kind of makes it sound suspenseful, but it's more of a drama. I gave this a four out of five stars and click the heart. I think this is the first standout film that I watched for the first time on the channel. I guess you could say Three Colors Red, but because I watched the trilogy so close together, it kind of like meshes in my head as one time. Therefore, the films in that trilogy almost feel like one. Plus, I'm kind of just differentiating because Red was a film that I really enjoyed and is like totally my taste. And this one was like, oh, this is a good film. Not that Red is not a good film, and not that I didn't enjoy this, but in my mind the situations are just different and separate. This actually had a recent American remake, but like gender swapped, and that confuses me based on the more like detailed premise of this. I'm sure it's probably an unnecessary and not good remake, but I'm interested in seeing it solely because I'm curious how they've done this switch. But unfortunately, After the Wedding is not available currently on the channel. And then the last film that I'm going to include in this video, look forward to the rest. Again, I have 92 films. This one is number 16, Christo's Valley Curtain, an American film from 1974. This is also a documentary directed by Albert and David Mazels, as well as Ellen Gifford is credited as director. This is the making of Christo and Jean-Claude's Valley Curtain, which was an art piece, a bright orange curtain installed between two mountain slopes in Rifle, Colorado. I gave this a three out of five stars. First off, I do want to point out that the title only credits the work as Christo's, and that's because for some reason it wasn't until 1994 that both were given credit for their art pieces. Again, I don't know the details of that, but for some reason that happens to be the case. As for my thoughts of this film, the documentary, I just think it's interesting seeing an artist work, and specifically because Christo and Jean-Claude do environmental works of art, the installation is a major element of the piece. Like, if it isn't installed, it's just an idea, and they don't have the knowledge or skills to really take part in the installation, so it's not all in their control, um, and that's just interesting to watch. I haven't watched any of the other documentaries, though, that are available on the channel. Um, there's numerous Christo and Jean-Claude art pieces that I'm assuming also directed by the Maisel brothers um, that are done. That was a terribly phrased sentence. I apologize. <laughs> but I think that just from this one, I can tell that they'd be great for art classes or art history classes. Yes, so this one is available on the channel, along with many other documentaries on Christo and Jean-Claude's work. So, that's going to be it for this video. I will talk about another chunk of the films that I watched on the Criterion channel in its first year. Comment about things that you watched, and if you watched any of these films, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. I'm really just hoping that this video and this video series turns out really well. I've also decided that I'm not going to put like a bunch of information in this video, in these videos, in the description. I'm just going to pretty much link to my letterbox list if you want to see the complete list of films because then that's just easier to see all the information that I would be including anyway. Usually I have like the title, the year, the director, um, at least. so. All that is just on Letterboxd already, so I'm just going to link that. Um, again, anything that I need to clarify or anything extra that I need to say will be in the description. I don't know how to end this, but please look forward to the rest of the videos. Specifically, I'm interested in hearing other people's thoughts on like where improvements can be made and like what they like about the channel because I didn't have Filmstruck, so... I don't know if, if things are going the same route as Filmstruck. I'm assuming yes, but I don't know for sure. And it'll be interesting in another year's time to see what else they bring to the channel in terms of films and in terms of, of the setup and how we're able to use the channel. Again, thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next installment.